Good evening, everybody. Uh, we apologize for the slight delay in beginning. We had a uh, slight technical problem. Uh, but uh, we'd like to welcome you to a live webcast being broadcast over LaRouchePack.com. My name is Matthew Ogden. I'm an editor with LPAC TV. Uh, and this is a regular Friday evening broadcast featuring Mr. Lyndon LaRouche. Now, this Friday, we find ourselves at the conclusion of a very interesting week uh, in, in view of what uh, our movement was able to accomplish, especially in Washington, D.C., uh, taking both the widespread dissemination and penetration of the uh, fact sheet that EIR and LPAC put together on the background to Benghazi, uh, Barack Obama's alliance directly with al-Qaeda by name in both Libya and Syria, which uh, reached the very highest levels of the United States Congress and other institutions in Washington, uh, together with a very significant uh, press conference that occurred on Capitol Hill featuring two congressmen, Walter B. Jones and Charlie Rangel of New York, uh, also featuring two very high-level uh, intelligence profes professionals and Jeffrey Steinberg from EIR. Uh, this uh, will both both of these subjects will be covered in the Q and A after tonight's uh, in the conclusion of tonight's event after Mr. LaRouche's opening remarks. We will be following the regular format uh, today. Joining us in the studio for the discussion period are Dennis Mason, an editor from LPAC TV, and Lamari Navarrete Bedford, also an editor with LaRouche Pack Television. So, with that said, I'm proud to bring to you Mr. Lyndon LaRouche. Well, there's an interesting trend, and it is a bit complicated if you want to be truthful about the whole matter. And I think that's probably the best policy to follow in this case. What's happened is there has been a gradual breakdown in the process around President Obama, or maybe ex-President Obama soon. Uh, and this breakdown has undergone a, a series of evolutions, not an evolution, but a series of evolutions, and back and forth. Now, what has happened, and there, there are a number of key things to have to take into account here in order to grasp the picture. This is not a simple one-shot explanation. It's a complicated process for outsiders, not for me anymore, of course, because I've been on, in on this thing. But I'm, I think the time has come in the whole process since we began this process of programming to begin to show what the potential victory might be. There's no guarantee that this is going to work, because you have the British Empire and the Saudis and so forth. These forces are working against us. They are relatively in the world. They are relatively powerful forces. And therefore, we cannot say that we've won the battle. But what we can say is that some very interesting developments have Come, broken loose here. And so we now have a completely different situation. And if you want to watch how the game is going, as they say over the real ball game, we have a real ball game going here. But it's whether we're going to win the game, that's still up for grabs. All right, now, what we have to take into account here is several things. One of the factors that's working now against Obama and company is the Benghazi issue that the fact that we now now months into this process, we had an event which was a 9-11 event, specifically a 9-11 event, a duplicate in date of the thing from 2001. A little smaller in scale, but the same thing. Obama and Obama's fakery on the issue of what things, events in Benghazi has contributed to this process. The wear and tear on uh, his ability to muster, the wear and tear on, on the whole process, is now very significant. There, there are also things, apart from how we can look at this process as I just described it, the other side of the thing is there is a sudden change, again, in the trend on the economic policy. Remember, it. Back in the earlier uh, months, we were at a point where people were talking about a Glass-Steagall option in Britain and elsewhere. That has come back on the agenda now rather forcefully. I wouldn't say it's any, in any sense guaranteed, but it's very forceful. 
you have to see the intersection among all these characteristics. First of all, o Obama can no longer conceal the fact that he is tied to al-Qaeda. That is no longer concealable. This came out very clearly in one form, in one place, another form, another place. But the fact is, and on the case of our representatives the, in, in Benghazi, our diplomatic representatives in Benghazi, this thing is now exposed. The whole crowd was, that was involved in that, behind it, was Obama. Obama was the actual backers backer of this process and the backers of this process of the Benghazi operation. What happened, what happened to our diplomatic uh, representatives there? Yeah? So that is now being treated by McCain and others very much up front. And that is the one thing that can really break this thing wide open. Because it's now clear that Obama himself is an accomplice of al-Qaeda. And that is rather an interesting development and might change a number of people's opinions about this matter rather rapidly. Again, no, no guarantee. Another side of the thing which is also have to be considered very prominently, we have a, a new surge of Glass-Steagall pro uh, proposals coming out of certain British banking circles. Where they're not going with the ring fences, they're going toward to an actual Glass-Steagall. And that changes it. Now, what that means, and this, this also will have the effect inside the United States on the economic policy. All right, what, what we're in is this. You have three elements in a Glass-Steagall package of the type that's relevant here to what we're doing now. The first is Glass-Steagall as such. A simple an enactment of Glass-Steagall as defined by Franklin Roosevelt originally is the first step. Without that, you're not going to get a solution. What we have now is in Britain, and some leakage in the continental Europe in this direction, but basically in Britain, a recognition that we need in Britain a Glass-Steagall solution. And they're rather emphatic about it. And it's not, it's not a hopeless cause. This, this can work. We need it on the United States side. Now, what on the United States side, the Glass-Steagall issue is very important but the driving consideration is coming from those forces which are raising the question of Al-Qaeda. Of Al the fact that we in the United States have been jobbed by a president of the United States who is tied to Al-Qaeda not only in the operations against our diplomats in Benghazi, but the same quality is running the entire operation against Syria. And, and the, it is he, him, pushing this policy in, in, that is the actual uh, master of the threat, immediate threat of war. The immediate threat of war comes from a, an organization which is the so-called freedom fighters in Syria. They are, they are Al-Qaeda. Now, what this means to me and to others who are rather experts in this aspect of the thing, this whole operation is a British-Saudi operation. I mean the whole operation. I mean the number one and 9-11 number one and 9-11 number two are the same thing. And uh, this gentleman, uh, our dear president, uh, is is an accomplice in both cases, in Syria and in the Benghazi effort, and it shows that the trace goes back to the original overthrow of Gaddafi. It's all one package. Now, this is the issue which is coming out more or less clearly in the what is going on in the Republican ranks in particular, but in the Congress generally. So now you have, you have a, a, a criminal action evidence of, of a crime committed by the incumbent president of the United States, a crime that goes back to the British and to a British, the British influence in this and also other things. So this is all one package. And now the question is, are people like McCain and company, a, Demo, a, a Republican, 
what, how, no, on the trot on this trot on this thing, are they going to stick to their guns? Because if so, Obama's candidacy for re-election is in real deep kimchi. And that, so therefore we have th that kind of situation. Now let's look at what, what is involved with the Glass-Steagall side of this thing. Glass-Steagall has more than three different elements which have to be combined in one in order to do the job. The first thing you have to pass the gl original Glass-Steagall Act as a re 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 renewed action, right? number one. But that does not solve the problem. That now allows you to solve the problem. Without Glass-Steagall in its original form, you cannot solve the problem. But you cannot solve the problem without going on a step further than Glass-Steagall as such. First of all, you're going to have to get a lot of credit organized. In other words, you're going to take the whole system of banking, and you're going to separate banking into two categories. The thieves, well, some of these guys are honest, but mostly we know the thieves. The thieves on, in, in this area, and uh, but then, but then one, beyond the thieves, we have to say, well, but that leaves us not enough money in the regular banking system, not enough money in the regular banking system to launch a recovery of the U.S. economy. And we now have in the United States in particular, but similarly in Europe. You have, in Europe, you have hyperinflation and collapse of the economies throughout Western and Central Europe. And so you, you have to do something about that. Central Europe, Europe, continental Europe, needs a Glass-Steagall solution. But they're less prepared for it than certain of the British bankers who have been, came back a second time after going the first time for a Glass-Steagall solution for Britain. Now, I'm all for a Glass-Steagall solution for Britain. That's not one of my problems with Britain. They should do it. They need it. There is no solution for them except by doing that. It's a very good idea, and I would be very happy to welcome it in, into the club. All right. So that, that's the first, the first step. But now you have to uh, get a new source of funding. Because once we have uh, taken care of reforming a highly corrupted, hyperinflationary uh, kind of system in our uh, financial system, the United States. There's not much money left that's not so dirty that you can't trade it. So therefore, you're going to have to find a source of credit you know, in order to lead a credit program which will enable you to finance a recovery. And uh, that gets kind of interesting because what that means is Money, as such, has no independent integrity. Money, as such. What, what has integrity in, in, the, in this kind of system is actually credit. Now, what does credit mean? Credit means you're starting from a f physical layer of, of a product, productive economy. And uh, you, you want to increase that layer. That is, you want to employ more people, you want to have higher technology, and so forth, because without that, you do not have a generated economy. If we go down to the bare facts without a credit system, combined with a Glass-Steagall system, you're not going to make it. There are certain things we can do. That's by using credit, for example, to launch glass, other things uh, in addition to the general Glass-Steagall program. So that's what we're going to have to put our heavy investment. And what we're going to do is we're going to do two things. First of all, there must be a credit system. In other words, the three things you have to do, you have to go to the Glass-Steagall, you have to establish a credit system, and you have to establish a program, which are a building program, an economic building program. Those three things are essential. Now, this has two elements. You have a lot of loose money roving around in various kinds of financial institutions. Some of this stuff is absolutely trash and cannot be salvaged. But you also are going to have private banking interests or private financial interests, which are in more or less intrinsically decent things to have. Uh, so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to take the credit potential in private banking, 
potentials of all kinds. And we're going to use that uh, or engage uh, financial interests to use that credit in order to f uh, contribute to long-term development. Now, the principle here is, if you look at an economy uh, rationally, competently, you see an economy uh, has to forget the money part. Let's look at the credit part. You, you have a certain amount of credit which is intrinsic in, in the present production, the present level and present production. That's intrinsic. You have a second one is that you have a future element. So what you don't look at money in terms of just plain money or dividing money. You take two categories. You take the category of currency, which is in circulation now, already in circulation, and you have an amount of credit added to that, which is your commitment to realize growth, economic growth. So once we do that, that means we have to keep a, a two-fold credit system. In one case, the credit system will be directly U.S. federal government credit, which will be the same kind of credit that uh, Andrew Jackson destroyed and tore up. We're going to restore that to the United States. In addition to that, we're going to, however, find uh, private interests, which are not just federal interests, but private interests, which also are prepared to uh, support investment and expansion. So therefore, you will have a system of credit, which will be federal credit, essentially, and then private credit. And the combination of federal and pri private credit, as it used to exist under John uh, Quincy Adams, that kind of credit would then comes into play. This creates sufficient credit in the system to have a general program of expansion. Now, we have two things that are obvious. One thing is, glass, is NOAPA. The NOAPA project is the largest project which is fungible at this time. That is, we can launch this now. It will take maybe 20 years or so to complete the project. One of the, it's the greatest project ever undertaken by mankind. Then we also have things like the leftovers of the automobile industry. They're, not, they're now trying to close out the last remnant of the automobile industry's role in the United States. Well, we, what we're going to do is we're going to say we, we need to bring back the machine tool capability, which was associated in a very large degree, or locked in a large degree, with the automobile industry and related industries. So we're going to have to have a credit system arrangement under the credit system in general that we create with the aid of Glass-Steagall, you have to have a credit system to rebuild the machine tool design capabilities of the United States. So we're talking about building up a very large increment of employment. Much of the people uh, population in this employment will not be very skilled people. We, but we're trying to capture, first of all, the highly skilled people who are either in retirement or about to go into retirement because they're, aid, they're aged out, essentially. But their skills, their knowledge is very valuable to us. And therefore, the, the idea of getting people hired for new kinds of employment in the, the areas such as Michigan and Ohio and so forth, getting them back into employment, even though their skills are limited at present, we can, assault, we can absorb that. And we will need to bring into play immediately uh, senior technicians who are capable of administering and directing the work. And so that's where we should be going. Uh, now, there's another aspect to this f still further, and what I, in addition to what I've just said. We, we have to we put this planet back together again. Uh, we probably should be pushing for a breakup of the euro system. It, it does not work and cannot work. It's a failure. And you find uh, Deutsche Bank is being raided by itself and everything, everybody else on the questionable value of their, some of their assets and these towers that they have out there. So we're going to have to rebuild the European system of, of, of national banking in your, uh, European nations. Because this, is a ver this potential Europe represents in the whole world economy is extremely important. It may not look so good on an individual nation-to-nation -nation basis, but when you look at the whole process and see what the potential is there, you realize that it's extremely valuable. This mean, what this means, then, is that we're going to 
build a system which restores, if, the, if people are sane, it's going to restore the sovereign nation states of Western and Central Europe and rebuild them out of this package that was so, of theft that was done there. That, that will do it. And that's, I think, where we, we're headed. Now, this means by, that when we go to this idea of cooperation on an international basis amongst respectively sovereign nation states, that means that immediately one thing and the second thing. The first thing is it means a system of peace for rebuilding the world on a basis of a higher productivity and meeting the challenges which we should meet anyway in terms of things. And secondly, it means that we're going to realize that the possibility of general warfare no longer exists in, the, in this planet. It doesn't exist anymore. There may be odd exceptions here and there, but we're going to have to say that the question of permanent peace among the nation states of, of, of this planet Earth, that that peace has got to be established immediately. Because any serious war at this time, because war by the nature of warfare, is going to tend toward thermonuclear war. And there's no way that the human species can outlive thermonuclear war. It can't be done. So therefore, the very idea of a reconstruction of the type I've just outlined on highlights, that reconstruction is also going to be the establishment of peace. But with one other element here. The greatest threat outside of war right now, in, the, in terms of immediacy, the greatest threat to humanity lies in defense of, pl of planet Earth against things like large rocks floating around there, millions of large rocks of various sizes. And these things can one of these large, larger rocks, which is floating out there, look, just looking for us, hits Earth, you're going to find a human extinction from, from this kind of thing. So therefore, we're going to have to immediately start moving directly into a Mars program. Because in order to develop a system that we, of the type we need, we must engage the capabilities of a Mars-Earth relationship to deal with that. So that means, again, that now the space program will be really immediately launched again. And this time it will have a very specific mission among its other missions. That mission is going to be to try to save Earth from the threats of these great rocks and comets as well. But we aren't even talking much about the comets because we're not sure but they are, how we're going to handle that. But the general thing from a asteroids, yes. We're going to have to organize with the aid of what we're building on Mars, various kinds of instruments and so forth, which are essential for this program. We're going to have to have an instrument, instrument development on Mars way beyond Curiosity. But Curiosity is an example of this. We're going to have to restore NOAPA, put NOAPA on. We're going to put NASA back on, in the picture. And these great projects will be among the great driver programs for humanity. These conditions are such with the fact that Obama is now tagged as being tied in to 9-11 in this terrorist domain, together with the Saudis and others in Qatar and so on. So that that has to be cleaned out. This, this thing has to be rearranged. And uh, we're going to have to build up two basic defense mechanisms. One against these asteroids and things of that type, which are a threat to mankind. We just missed one recently, or they missed us somehow recently. And also we're going to have to <coughs> develop the, uh, a system of economy, which will be more than global. It will include Mars. Um, and it will be a, the system we need. And so therefore we are at a point where when you put together these elements, you put together the, the British bankers 
who are again, again pushing for Glass-Steagall. That's a plus, and that's real. That's realistic. Uh, when you realize that the whole system now is going into hyperinflation otherwise, you know you have no choice but to go with it. Uh, when you think about what the requirements are for defending people on Earth from asteroids wiping out whole city areas or even much something permanent for humanity, we need that too. So we're now at a point where these things are necessary and they're feasible. And the thing that's really pushing this in our direction is the failures of the British and their stooge Obama. That thing is not going to work. It cannot work. The only way it can work is lead to an extinction of humanity. So that, therefore, there's a qualified reason to believe that we could come out of this operation successfully. But the elements I've identified, and I've tried to rush through this so it doesn't take too much time, uh, that, that is the way we can solve this problem. It's available to us now. And the peace prospects in that direction are good. But right now we're on the threshold. If we fail to deal with this Obama problem, if we fail to, to deal with the crisis, if we fail to carry out Glass-Steagall immediately, because the immediate installation of Glass-Steagall is the most essential part in the whole thing to move this. Otherwise, you can't move it. And that's where we are. So we have, should we say, as Gabriel Heater once used to say, there's good news tonight, and there's also some bad.